Despite all the problems with online advertising, ads are not going away. Advertising is fundamental to the modern internet economy. In previous episodes of Software Engineering Daily, we have mostly dissected the problems of ad tech. Bots, tracking, fraud, brand safety. We've talked about some solutions. For example, JavaScript tags that you can put on a page to identify a bot before you serve it an ad. But these solutions don't get the job done completely, because it isn't possible to reliably identify bots. Today we explore another solution for ad tech, the whitelist. Mark Goldberg is the CEO of Trustmetrics, a company that provides whitelisting for advertisers. A whitelist is a list of domains that are acceptable to run your advertisements on. In order to build a whitelist, you need to review thousands of sites to judge which ones are reasonable places to publish an advertisement. Mark joins the show to describe how to build and scale a system for reviewing websites and judging whether they are safe to run ads against. If you like this episode, we've done other shows about advertising fraud. Download the Software Engineering Daily app for iOS or Android and hear all of our old episodes easily discover new topics that might interest you. And if you don't like this episode, you can find something much more interesting by looking at our recommendation system in the app. The mobile apps are open sourced at github.com slash software engineering daily. And if you're looking for an open source project to hack on, we would love to get your help. The software engineering daily open source community is building a new way to consume software engineering content. And we have an Android app, an iOS app, a recommendation system, and a web front end. If you're interested in contributing, check out github.com slash softwareengineeringdaily. Send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com, or join our Slack channel, which you can find a link to on our website. And with that, let's get on with this episode. Grammatech Code Sonar helps development teams improve code quality with static analysis. It helps flag issues early in the development process, allowing developers to release better code faster. Code Sonar can easily be integrated into any development process. Code Sonar performs advanced static analysis of C, C, Java, and even raw binary code. Code Sonar performs unique data flow and symbolic execution analysis to aggressively scan for problems in your code. Just like battleships use sonar to detect objects deep underwater, engineers use Code Sonar to detect subtle problems deep within their code. Go to go.grammatech.com/sedaily to get your free 30-day trial exclusively for Software Engineering Daily listeners. Code Sonar analyzes your code and it delivers a detailed report. The Code Sonar user interface provides all the information that you need to quickly understand the reports. Follow cross functional paths, understand cross references, quickly navigate between files, and visualize large pieces of your code. Go to go.grammatech.com slash SE daily to get your 30 day free trial and unleash the power of advanced static analysis. Thanks to Grammatech for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Mark Goldberg is the CEO of Trust Metrics. Mark, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Today we're going to talk about advertising fraud and the problems that it causes and some potential solutions. And you have been in the internet space for a pretty long time. You've worked at a variety of different companies, uh, kind of in publishing and ad sales. Why don't you give a bit of a description for how you have seen the evolution of online advertising from your point of view? Sure. So I, I grew up on the agency side side buying media and I was pretty frustrated watching, you know, my TV dollars get spent on commercials that were never seen because people had to go to the bathroom or go buy make popcorn. And when online advertising came up to to play, uh, I really got excited because, you know, the impression loaded. 
and and the user saw it. So that that by concept, I thought that was wonderful. And, and so, you know, I started on the, you know, more or less the ad network side into the publisher side. And then I and then I started to realize uh, maybe, you know, outside of publishing, what else can I be doing? And I started learning about the ad tech side. And and I've been here for for a couple of years now. And can you just give a brief, brief description for the, the companies that you worked at and how they interfaced with the advertising ecosystem? Sure. So uh, I was at Zenith, and Zenith Media and J. Walter Thompson, and then I went into, uh, which are two ad agencies, I went into a rep firm called Phase 2 Media that's uh, no longer in existence. That was during around 2000. Um, and then I uh, put my hat down at, at about.com for over 10 years, and I, I experienced a, a lot of different aspects of that, that business. I, I helped the uh, sales team sell more effectively. I helped buy and acquire companies. And when you start getting into the ad ecosystem, I was really at the beginning – one of the first beta partners of Google's ad exchange. And I was really thought of at, at our side, uh, in our world as the guy who kind of handled all the ad network and ad exchange business. Mm-hmm. So uh, I started that side pretty early. Um, that was probably 04, 05, 06, I would say. And then, you know, I went to different publishers and had different experiences uh, with the ad ecosystem. And now at Trustmetrics, I'm, I have a very different uh, relationship with the ad ecosystem, I'm kind of sitting back watching it and trying to help fix it, uh, and, to be honest. And uh, about .com, where you spent a decade, I think that was the longest position of your career so far, that was an early collection of publishers. Is that correct? It was, it was like different different websites, different media properties that people went to to do various things on the internet. Yeah, it was the first publish first model. We basically created a platform for individual verticals to, to, to live and grow. We found experts to write content. And this is at the beginning where we thought, you know, everything you need to know about dogs was not only written by one person, but it was also a collection of sending people in the right direction to make sure they could understand everything you need to know about dogs. So we did each individual topic. So dogs.about.com, cats.about.com, you know, to fibromyalgia.about.com. Each one had an individual topic. So it was great for contextual advertising, whether it was Google's advertisements or even big brands trying to come and buy and acquire a lot of inventory, a lot of eyeballs in, in, in verticals. Uh, about.com was originally uh, owned by Prime Media, then New York Times, and now IAC. IAC owns it today. It's actually gone through a major rebranding. I can't even remember what the name of the company now, but um, it's a different different brand. It no longer really exists. Mm. But, but back then, when you were an early publisher with a lot of volume and you integrated with some of the earliest advertising exchanges, did you start to get a vision for, for some of the advertising fraud? Did, was fraud taking place back in those days, in the, the early days of exchange integration? Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, it's funny because the first – so I was very much a believer in one ad exchange – because if you could kind of control the supply and understand and put your supply in one place, then the market economics would kind of the, – the, the bid economy would, would flourish. In other words, the rates would go up because it would need to find your inventory where, where it knew it was. And other ad exchanges would come to me saying, stop using Google, use mine, whether it was Rubicon, AdMail when they were part of – when not part of Google – all those guys would come into my office and try to pitch me. And then people would start to say, hey, I see your inventory here. And I didn't understand why my inventory was somewhere else. And it turns out there was either spoofing going on or ad injection services. So ad injections, a form of fraud where it's a downloadable product on someone's device or someone's computer that's injecting ads into a publisher's page. And you can go to the New York Times or you can go to YouTube and you would see a couple ad units. But now all of a sudden there's like six ad units and and these ad units are are – all over the place, but it's it, it, these ads were coming from an injector, which is a form of fraud because this publisher never wanted these ads on the page. And so that was my first introduction, and I started to figure out, oh my gosh, look at all of these different things going on. People are buying traffic. People are selling traffic for, for subpenny. How are they doing that? And you start to really understand that there's this whole underbelly of the ad ecosystem. I think what we read in some of the, the big publications – you know, that's just the surface level. There's a complete underbelly. You can go find on Reddit what, what's really going on. You can go find if you type in a certain keywords in Google or, or LinkedIn where to find all the bad guys. They're in plain sight. When you say what's really going on and you re- refer to the bad guys, what are you referring to there? 
Sure. So a lot of people think the botnet operators and these big fraud organizations are coming from China, Russia, and uh, India, and there's these big farms and certain people in rooms. There is some truth to that. However, you can go next door and see your neighbor in their basement doing things. The bad guys, and when I say bad guys, are the people who are creating fraud. You can go into Reddit and see that these – this is a great example. On Reddit, I found – or someone else shared it with me. A web page, a, a, a Reddit where someone was asking the question, how do I – get a new router because my router's burnt out because the 60 phones I have in my house to, to utilize for my for my traffic farming, it, it's burning my router. <laughs> uh, well, wait a minute. Who, who, someone's doing this. Who's doing it? It's perfect English. I mean, it's not like it's coming from another country. This is a, this is a U.S. probably citizen, probably, again, next door to you. That's kind of the, the real oh boy moment where – it's not just non-U.S. citizens in large organizations or quote-unquote quote, criminal organizations. That is happening. However, there's a completely different side of this where it is actually you know, people doing things here. And you know, we can get into fake news later, I know, but like the Macedonian teenagers is, is the big article from BuzzFeed. They do a great job in fake news. But there's also the guy in Colorado, and I cannot remember his name, but he was on 60 Minutes. He's actually that. creating creating fake fake news sites. Like it's it's here. The Denver Guardian. And yes, exactly. And so so this is not just limited to the bad guys in terms of criminal organizations or or non U.S. citizens. There there are people who just don't have the right intent. And yeah, but, so for, I, for for those who don't know, this Denver Guardian story is sometime during the election or shortly after the election. Uh, this this guy who who had been writing fake news from Colorado with a, a website that sounded real, the Denver Guardian, he was writing that fake news just to get traffic to come to his site to get ad revenue. It wasn't about propaganda. It wasn't about skewing an election in one direction or another. Not to say that those things are impossible or even improbable, but the reality is that it doesn't even have to be that complicated Fake news can be motivated simply by money. Absolutely. And so, you know, I am in a lot of conversations around is fake news political or is it fraud? And it's both because there are is some political espionage going on. And, and I don't want to get into that side of the world, but there is it's really at the end of the day a form of fake publishing. And when I say fake publishing, you can create a food site with recipes that you copy and paste and try to try to get into the search engines to rank to then, you know, creating a celebrity site and trying to get into the social media. All fake news is is really, you know, trying to get a headline to get someone to click on to get a user to in, into that ecosystem. And and I'm, and we're going really fast here, but let's just take that for a second and say why do they want traffic to go? Ad dollars. Why do they need the humans is actually very important because when they send 100% bot activity to these sites, they get caught by the detection services. If they can mask, and I think you've heard from Shaolin and others that have been on the program, if they can say that some humans are going here, the sampling of the detection services gets tricked. Traffic. And when it gets that's, that's traffic laundering, or I, that's, I call it traffic laundering, basically – you just need some minimum amount of human traffic in order to dupe the bot detection techniques, the naive bot detection techniques, because if, let's say, 15% of your traffic is is legitimate and then the other 85% is bots, well, they can't just blacklist the site from displaying ads because there's a lot of legitimate traffic going there. So, you know, kind of the only question is how much human exactly. traffic. And, and, you know, I... Uh, Shaolin and I exchange messages occasionally. I, I, you know, I, I remember a while ago I was on the internet. I was just like on Twitter, you know, just browsing Twitter, and I saw some retweet from some account. For some reason, I was just like, something about this account looks weird. Like, I don't know. Sometimes I, I, I've looked into these bots, like different types of bots, so often at this point. Like, I when I see an account, I can sometimes just tell that the way that this account is tweeting it is automated. Yep. And so it's always curious when you see an account that it, it, you can tell it's automated by looking at it, by looking at the way that the tweet goes out. But you look at the the account profile and you're like, well, it's a human, right? Like, it's, like this is a human. This is a picture of a human. He's carrying his kids, and he's got you know, you know, a nice picture of his dog as his uh, you know profile background picture. And you know, it, it's like you know, Todd 
Todd Schmertz, Todd Schmertz holder, you know, like uh, <laughs> journalist, you know, tech journalist, and he's got like an about.me profile. He's got a LinkedIn profile. Like you drill into his Twitter account and you look at all his different profiles. And you're like, huh, this guy is a really well-developed fake account. And then you look at the, the site that he always publishes to and it's a site that's just like complete garbage like n- quote unquote news or tech news or reviews of a movie or some garbage site like that and there's ads all over the site and it's something that no human would ever consume and yet there's ads for Volvo and Wonder the Wonder Woman movie playing on this website and the depth and sophistication of these botnets and these fake traffic schemes these fake news schemes I mean, from my point of view, I'm not hurt by it, so it's kind of hilarious to me, and I enjoy reporting <laughs> on it, but it causes serious harm to the internet and the flow of information. Oh, no question. I mean, you know, I, I kind of laugh because it, uh, these profiles, when you start digging into it, sometimes you think, well, this this actually looks like it could be real be- because a lot of the bad guys are going at, at, at great lengths to develop these profiles. And, you know, I found one recently where the same comment was, be- was the, so there was a comment on a, on a big, I think it was a Donald Trump Facebook page and you copy and paste the comment and you can find it on six different places. And when you take that comment and you look at the different profiles, it, all they're doing is creating these profiles to make comments to make a fake news site look a little bit more reputable. So they're going at great lengths to develop the profiles, whether it's in LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. They're going at great lengths to make these profiles look as real as possible because, again, they want to detect, you know, bypass the, the, the other services to make sure that, you know, when someone's looking, this looks legit. Who do you use for log management? I want to tell you about Scalar, the first purpose-built log management tool on the market. Most tools on the market utilize text indexing search, and this is great for indexing a book, for example. But if you want to search logs at scale fast, it breaks down. Scalar built their own database from scratch, and the system is fast, Most of the searches take less than a second. In fact, 99% of the queries execute in less than a second. That's why companies like OkCupid and Giphy and CareerBuilder use Scalar to build their log management systems. You can try it today, free, for 90 days if you go to the promo URL, which is softwareengineeringdaily.com slash scalar. S C A L Y R. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash scalar. Scalar was built by one of the founders of Rightly, which is the company that became Google Docs. And if you know anything about Google Docs history, it was quite uh, transformational when the product came out. Um, this was a consumer grade UI product that solved many distributed systems problems and had great scalability which is why it turned into Google Docs. And so the founder of Ridley is now turning his focus to log management. And it has the consumer-grade UI. It has the scalability that you would expect from somebody who built Google Docs. And you can use Scalar to monitor key metrics. You can use it to trigger alerts. It's got integration with PagerDuty. And it's really easy to use. It's really lightning fast. And you can get a free 90-day trial by signing up at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash S-C-A-L-Y-R. Softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Scalar. And I really recommend trying it out. I've heard from multiple companies on the show that they use Scalar, and it's been a real differentiator for them. So check out Scalar, and thanks to Scalar for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Now, we hear that all of the advertising revenue is now going to funnel, funneling into Google and Facebook. Do you have any idea like how much of the advertising deal flow is still subject to these ki- kinds of random sites that are 
maybe maybe out of the per because like you know when when I say going into Google or Facebook seven I think that seventy five percent is search search advertising of Google seventy five percent of Google's advertising is search twenty five percent is the display network so I guess that twenty five percent of that could be subject to these fake sites. I'm not sure how much Facebook does display advertising outside of the Facebook walled garden. But I think when we're talking about these fake journalism sites that are just uh, generated content, these are typically ad networks that are outside of the the Facebook and Google ecosystem. Is that accurate? Well, I, I think you're very, it's very accurate right now in that Google and Facebook are dominating most of the display dollars. I think Amazon has created a new third player. Uh, it does have its issues, but I, I think Facebook and Google are the real two dominant ones, and everyone's just kind of feeding off the rest, and the rest is still big. That, that, that's, that's something that I think people don't understand is the rest is still big. Is it big enough long-term to scale for everybody? Well, right now, I think we're looking at these as duopoly at the end of the day with Google and Facebook dominating and, and no signs of like getting weaker. Unfortunately, the fraud hits them too. They're just much better at it, at protecting because they have enough resources to look through it. And I think Google learned very early in the CPC model that if you make advertisers happy, by giving them good performance, they will pay more. And in the CPC model, when you, pay, you people would pay higher and higher for good quality clicks. You will pay higher and higher for quality inventory. And I think Google got that right the first iteration. And now with display, I think they're starting to see a little bit of uh, uh, headaches with with video and because of just YouTube so massive, people come there and, and it's a target now. But I think Google has done a very good job. They are not immune and no one is perfect at preventing 100% ad fraud. So, you know, Google and Facebook are are obviously two huge entities that have a lot of unique users and provide a lot of great options for advertisers, but they're not the only options. I think what I, I hope happens is that you know advertising inventory starts to clean up and everyone will start to see where the quality is and hopefully people will start paying publishers for higher quality because it will do more and better performance-wise. Now, so I believe... Tell me if I'm wrong. The amount of ad dollars in dis, in uh, online advertising ver- versus uh, television. Online advertising just passed the dollar spend in television. Was it last year? Is that accurate? I don't think I've heard that number. Um, okay. I know it's growing. Hmm. I know it's important. I don't know if it's crossed crossed that big number. Hmm. Wow. That that if if that's true. Wow. But. I'm a little concerned, um, and you can talk about you know the Procter and Gamble's pulling out of digital, and a lot of the news around fraud, and a lot of the news around you know brand safety. People are getting scared, and what I'm trying to do is make sure they're not scared as buyers. They want to go into the marketplace, knowledge, w- understanding what's good, what's bad, and being able to buy with a lot more intelligence. Mm-hmm. Because when you do find humans in good environments. It should work. It will work. And it's exactly what you want to do because if you I, – I have kids that all they do is look at these phones or they're online. And I know you know a lot of behavior is starting to change. You're not watching TV. You're watching Netflix or Amazon or Hulu. And so a lot of the stuff is moving away from, from, from television. It's still a great platform. Don't get me wrong. But digital is a very, very real thing, and I don't see it going away, Or, but I do see it getting more but being bought more intelligently and when i say that is having multiple kpis applying best practices there are things that we need to do in digital that have not been done and we need a hard reset to do and i don't want people to run away from it i want people to stop breathe think buy mm-hmm. right and so we'll get into some of the prevention techniques including what you're doing with trust metrics you pointed out the Procter and Gamble example. I think that was something like. Was there also was there also a case with City? Was it Citigroup? I think there was another big one, right? Toyota? So, so yeah, Procter and Gamble pulled out about one hundred forty million dollars out of digital, and then Chase is the other brand, probably Chase. that was in the New York Times. They 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 basically came out and said that, you know, we're not buying hundreds and hundreds of thousands of domains anymore. We're we're we're, we're focusing on a lot smaller. And I think uh, a couple other brands have come out via the ANA studies about you know standing a little tighter and tougher with di- uh, with their digital dollars. It's happening. I'm just a little concerned that we're we're all going to do it and pull out digital. That's not the right strategy. That is 
the absolutely not the right strategy. I'm not saying give it all to Facebook or Google. I'm not saying, you know, pull out and give it to TV. I'm saying think about the original intent. Yeah. Well, of course, and, and, and this is this is, of course, what I, uh, you know, I always caveat these episodes where I'm diving deep into fraud. I'm not throwing, I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Advertising obviously works, and that's why they're. Why, that's why Google and Facebook have been able to build their businesses off of it. That's why people have been building businesses off of advertising for a really long time. And by building a business off of advertising, I'm not just saying building an advertising company. I'm talking about people that have made great advertising, and that has led to sales of their product. That's a beautiful part of business, and that should be maintained. But uh, you know, obviously, if you know, if, if the companies are, you know, I, I think that the Procter & Gamble example was like they, they pulled out almost, they pulled out like all but 5% of their digital ad spend or something like, some, something crazy like that. And they noticed no change in sales. They did basically a, sig- yep. a very significant A-B test and they noticed zero change in sales. So, I mean, <laughs> honestly speaking, part of that could be because you know, maybe they've got outdated ad copy, or you know, that is even because when I see it, even when I see a display ad from something that's a Procter and Gamble product, I probably have ad blindness to it. And I think even even like I can't think of, I can't imagine somebody in my life who does not have ad blindness to that kind of thing. So you know, maybe some of it is the creative, maybe some of it is the the quality of the ads, maybe it's the context. But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So how are brands and agencies? discussing fraud these days how does does it do, how does it factor into their conversations these days how is it changing their buying patterns and you know how is it changing their choices in technology solutions yeah no that's a great question i think those are the questions that are being talked about a lot more today you know, I go back to the TV example where the ad, uh, where, where you left the room and the the ad ran, you didn't pay for it, and then you know, you start having a relationship with an ESPN.com or New York Times, you get sold a sponsorship and your banners on the on the uh, below the fold, but they priced it for you that way. Once programmatic came into the conversation, uh, those banners below the fold were getting loaded, and when they continued to get loaded, they would be, you know bid on in the programmatic exchanges with a cookie attached to it so it would have more value. So publishers for a while were making a couple more dollars than they probably should have. And then the agencies and advertisers said, wait, 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 what's going on? Why is this happening? That, that ad wasn't viewed. Well, I'm not paying for it. And so now this new term viewability comes into the conversation. Now they only want to pay for viewability. So that started the conversation, and then they then then people started to argue about what's viewable, what's not, and I don't want to debate that. That's uh, what the IAB, which is the Internet Advertising Bureau, and the MRC, the Media Rating Council, has established as val- as the, the standards. But those conversations led into, well, what's happening with the viewable? Why isn't it viewable? And then it became, well, that's not a human. Wait, is that a human? And they started realizing more and more, uh oh, we have fraud. A and A comes out, uh oh, we have fraud. There is no fault to the agencies, and I wish people would understand this, that they didn't know because, quite frankly, a lot of people didn't know how bad it was. But now that the knowledge is starting to get uh, understood, you have to select vendors. And and I think, you know, I think you've had Dr. Fu on before and you've had Shalin on before and you've had some other people from Method. You know, this is a very complex stuff. Even the good guys like us don't know everything. Mm. But what we do know is that no one's perfect. And I think agencies look at this the space as okay, there has to be one vendor that can do this, and they have they check the most boxes. Let's choose them. And I think they have this comfort in this checkbox mentality where we don't want to pay for something that's not actually media. So let's just say this is working, and if it's working, then we're fine. And I think it's becoming more and more clear to a lot of advertisers that not one approach is working. We have to be very careful of just saying that something's working or not working. It's not absolute. And that's where I see the bigger problem about to happen is that uh, all the detection services are trying to do a good job. And, you know, when you're in a detection service like a security ver- – like Kaperskys or, or any of those other guys that have, you know, the ad- that, that world with malware, 
they're at every day fighting the fight. The bad guys are always going to be trying and always trying to be better than the good guys. And and now we're in the detection service. The same thing's happening. Mm. People are reverse engineering the good guys. People are tricking the good guys. And so if you only have one good guy looking at it, well, there's a good possibility that they're getting tricked by some way. So if you have multiple approach, y- you may be a bit better off. And mm. so I think the conversation that's been happening with the, the agencies is – if they're smart agencies, they're starting to tell the brands, listen, you have to have multiple KPIs. It's not just about viewability. If we ask for a guarantee, we're running into a big risk. We are going to ask for a guarantee. We're not going to choose vendors that say they have a guarantee of 100% viewability or 100% fraud free. We're going to expect it. And so with the buying power, you can actually change the conversation. And I think advertisers need to set the tone. Agencies, there, there's a question of how much incentive they have to make this go away. Mm-hmm. But but if you're a good agency and you're doing right by your client, you don't want to have to pitch a nut, that same client, that the same business you're running, you're going to make take the measures that you need to take. So the, so the agency – Discussion I think is a little bit interesting, um, just because you know we said about the the misaligned incentives. So you know, a giant company like a Ford or Procter and Gamble that does brand advertising, that is advertising where you you're not measuring the you can't really measure the end to end funnel very well. All you can measure is that we are getting this in front of people, or we are getting it. We are buying impressions, and those are being displayed to a person or a bot. You know, and and people are having their psychology changed over time to be convinced of Ford, be convinced of Dove soap, or be convinced of Coca Cola over Pepsi. That is brand advertising, and large brand advertising purchases often take place through an agency. A brand like Coca Cola goes to a giant agency or five giant agencies and purchases their ads through the agency. And the agency's performance is not benchmarked in a way that is like makes them beholden oftentimes to really good quality. So, you know, Coca Cola pays the agency X million dollars, and the agency is just going to go out and buy the cheapest traffic that they, the cheapest uh, set of impressions that they can in some scenarios. Of course, there are agencies that do right by their customers. But uh, you know, as as you are saying here, there's a question of misaligned incentives, and that's problematic because a lot of this display advertising on non-walled garden environments that are not like non-Facebook, non-Google environments, those are display brand advertising. They're un- and so it's just uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's just pro- problematic relationship, and and um, you know, unless the brands start in-housing a lot of their ad buys, then it you know it's maybe it's not going to go away at the behest of the agencies. No. There, there are very few people on the planet that can bring it in-house uh, that have the enough scale and need for, for programmatic. Agencies are necessary. And I think what the, the, the buyer, the, the clients need to do is really set the standards and set the tone early and often and be accepting of some of the things that have gone wrong in the past to fix. If you are asking for 100% viewability to your agency, your agency is going to turn around and buy the worst sites on the internet. Yeah. That's what they're going to do. So, you know, the great example I like to give is fake news. Fake news, it's quote unquote brand safe. There is no swear words or pornography. So the detection service is saying it's good. It's viewable. There's 10 ads above the fold. It's viewable. And it's human because your your uncle on your mom's side is, is posting it and you're gullible enough to click on it. And all of a sudden you're there. That's human. So fake news is actually – based on a client's thought process is perfect for them. But so, once they have that conversation with the New York Times reporter or another reporter and and they start thinking about the ramifications of fake news, then they start getting uh, a better understanding about brand safety and how it does matter. Because I think what's happening is more people are starting to understand that context does matter because for the last couple of years, we've been told it's about audience buying and finding the right audience pockets. I think there's a combination of both that win in the long term, but you know, that's that's my view. Indeed Prime flips the typical model of job search and makes it easy to apply to multiple jobs and get multiple offers. Indeed Prime simplifies your job search and helps you land that ideal software engineering position from companies like Facebook or Uber or Dropbox. 
Candidates get immediate exposure to top companies with just one simple application to Indeed Prime. And the companies on Prime's exclusive platform message the candidates with salary and equity up front. Indeed Prime is 100% free for candidates. There are no strings attached. Sign up now and help support Software Engineering Daily by going to indeed.com slash sedaily. That's indeed.com slash sedaily if you're looking for a job and want a simpler job search experience. You can also put money in your pocket by referring your friends and colleagues. Refer a software engineer to the platform and get $200 when they get contacted by a company and $2,000 when they accept a job through Prime. You can learn more about this at indeed.com slash prime slash referral. That's indeed.com slash prime slash referral for the Indeed referral program. Thanks to Indeed for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. If I ever leave the podcasting world and need to find a job once again, Indeed Prime will be my first stop. So as we sidle towards a discussion of the, uh, the the prevention techniques that can actually work here, you know, you mentioned needing multiple techniques in order to effectively combat fraud. You can't just have a single bot detection provider, and you know, part part of the reason for that is just because. I mean, I've asked several of the bot three, I think three or four of the main bot detection companies. I've asked them, you know, tell me how can you define the difference between a bot and a human? And they they cannot. They cannot tell me. And so I'm like, okay, so how can you say with confidence that you are catching X percent of bot traffic? You know, you're catching 99% of bot traffic. Okay, if if you can define that metric, you sure as hell be able better be able to define what is a bot and what is a human. And they can't say that to me. And that's because like there are crawlers, there are there are replay attacks. You can replay human behavior. You can build a machine learning model that replays human behavior and that's a bot and it looks like a human and you can't tell me that you're detecting all of that. That's not to say that we should, you know, throw these bot detection providers under the bus, but I think that they would do well to adopt a little bit more humility and perhaps a bit of, bit more realism. Of course, maybe that doesn't sell as well. But anyway, you want to use bot detection providers, why not? Might as well. And you want to use other techniques. And so that's why I I want to get into discussing trust metrics, which is your solution, the whitelisting of domains. First of all, I guess before we even get into to that, maybe you could define why why you need why like the bot detection filters. Like if you if you put a, a blob of JavaScript on your website and every user that hits your website gets filtered against that JavaScript blob, it, which is which represents a model that determines whether you're a human or a bot. Explain why that is not good enough in terms of fraud prevention. When you put it on your own site, actually, that's one of the better ways. But a lot of people are using it in banner. It, they're using it in pre-bid. And there's a variety of sampling issues that come with that. There's a variety of ways that the bad guys know what you're doing, and so they can protect it. And so, you know, when when you start looking at the the, the better ways, I, I would say actually putting code on the, your publisher page is a good way. But but buying programmatically, you that means all the publishers you're buying have to have that code, and that's just not realistic. Does that, does that make sense? It does make sense. Okay. So, so, so what what comes with, you know, listen, I mean, if you're an ESPN and New York Times or whatever, you're going to subscribe to the fact that you want to put this code on the page, whether it's ads.txt initiative by IAB or, or, or some other program to help you understand what's human or not human. But the problem is actually when people are buying you programmatically – they don't care. They don't. They don't. They don't see that code on the page or knows you're human or not human. They they need to understand what's going on. To, you know, seven thousand other websites. So you know, th- there's a little bit of a problem where it's you know with, when you're when you're a direct buy, that's a good thing to have. And and as an agency, you want to do business with ESPN. That's that's great. I I love that you want to do that. However, you also want to buy. Uh, the other sites via the other DSP mentality. One of the things I want to make sure I say is, you know, each site 
has some bot activity and you touched on it there there are good bots google bots a bot right i mean there there are good bots so there there are some bot activity on the new york times espn and if they buy traffic to support a campaign there actually might be more because that's where a lot of the bad fraud happens however if you have a direct relationship with espn and all of a sudden you see espn's fraud levels go from four percent which might be acceptable to 15 to 17 percent which might not be acceptable you know who you call? ESPN. Hmm. You don't have that opportunity to call Craptacular Blog 1, <laughs> Craptacular Blog 2, Craptacular Blog hmm. Fake News 3. Right. And I think that's the difference is you can hold ESPN accountable and you can hold big brands accountable. And therefore, I think if we do this right, the brands that we know and maybe love – will be better off in the long term because they know the risk as you talk about growing a business they know the risk of losing you know fourth quarter revenue they know the risk of not having that advertiser that was there last year they know the risks in bot world and the fake world the site that's here today when it gets blacklisted or found out or not seeing revenue it's gone tomorrow they just turn it off so you can look at some of these fake news sites that, that that were famous during you know the election cycle and go to those domains today. They're not there anymore. Hmm. And and so what I like to say is you know they're here today, gone tomorrow. But they weren't on your whitelist or black. They weren't on your blacklist yesterday because you didn't even know about it. And now that you know about it, it's gone. So so th- th- there is that problem with whitelisting and blacklisting in that you have to know it. And and what we're saying at Trust Metrics, and maybe this is a segue. I think you're, you you want me to do, but. At Trustmetrics, we're, we're scanning domains and apps for quality, safety, and fraud signals. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we're doing this with both machine crawl as well as human review. The machine will crawl a certain amount of pages. The human looks at a certain amount of pages, but it's the combination of both of them with the feedback back to the machine to continue to look for things that allow us to understand what a site is, where it belongs in terms of a taxonomy, what type of score it should get in terms of quality. There are a lot of things that go into our scores. And and you're focused on whitelisting because absolutely yes because the pro- the problem with blacklisting is you get taken by Hillary Clinton is a lizard dot com for you know fifty million impressions and then by the time you realize it it's too late you've already lost you know you've already spent money on those impressions so the whitelist is basically the idea of Let's just assume that most of the internet is not worth displaying ads against or running ads against. You only want to, you know, assign ads to this specific list, this white list of of domains. Yes, and I would say it a little differently in that not all brands have the same thresholds or criteria of what's quality to them. And so, you know, in terms of brand safety, you know, there are some brands that are sensitive for a variety of reasons, whether their CEO is is always concerned about, you know, whether it's gender, alcohol or, or, or some other reason to then – Legal, like pharma and finance, there's legal risks to running on indiv- certain types of sites. So brand safety, there's a spectrum here where maybe someone doesn't want to be seen too political, whether it's right or left or seen in news at this point. You know, the, the, there's deltas and, and travel uh, partners of the world where there's a plane crash. They want all their ads away from it. So there's a lot of issues around brand safety that, you know, all of a sudden become a byproduct of what we're talking about. Airlines are a great example. They want to be away from things like like fright, flight crashes. So, so they want it at that moment. Each brand has different criteria. And so all we're saying is let us know your criteria and we will build a list that is representative of you, brand advertiser. So we're not handing the same sites to the same – all the different people. We're not defining the ad ecosystem with our, our database. We are defining your ad ecosystem. And how we're doing this is we're not scanning the web. We're not putting a crawler up and saying, go find everything on the web. We're not getting Wikipedia pages. We get submissions from ad networks, ad exchanges, advertisers of domains to, to, to look through. And so we're really only looking at the ad ecosystem. Hmm. We have over, we have over, uh, over or close to a million domains in our database and we have scores on all of them. And when an advertiser comes to us, if it's if it's they're working with a DSP, we would help build a list based on their criteria. If they're working with an ad network who procures their own inventory, the network would submit their lists. We would then scrub their list based on our database and their criteria and figure out which sites are acceptable to run on. Mm. Sorry. So the the brand or the 
DSP comes to you with their list of domains that they could potentially run ad inventory on, and they check it against your database? Yes, we, we, we check it against the database based on the client-specific criteria. Mm-hmm. So in other words, if credit card brand doesn't want, you know, anime, dating, politics, we and they want a, a quality threshold of X, and I don't want to get too detailed about what, what quality means in, in this conversation, but they, they set the criteria. We then look at our database, build a list for the DSP, hand it to them. The network comes to us. We then scrub it against that criteria, give it back to them and say, you can only run on this, and DSP, you can run on that. Mm. Now, so if, if, so if I'm a DSP, a dem, uh, that's, what is that, demand, demand side platform, I think? Yes, yeah, sorry, I should have done that. No, yes. no, no, that's okay, that's okay. So demand side platform, that is the aggregator of demand. So basically, what is it? So, so they, they would sit on the top and, and basically all your cookies and all of your uh, bid strategies live in the DSP and the DSP is looking into the SSP, which is the supply side. So they're looking into the supply side, looking for the inventory. What we're saying is take these 10,000 sites and only go into the supply side looking for these 10,000 sites. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. So just to clarify a little bit more, so the before... Before they, before the DSP engages with trust metrics, they have a, a a very long list of places that they are buying inventory, and then they say to trust metrics, "Hey, you know, we we want to impose some certain criteria against our current list of domains that we're buying from. Help us impose that criteria, and that's what trust metrics does." Uh, yes, but I would say it's the DSP and the networks are not coming to us. It's the agencies and advertisers that we have the relationships with. So it's the advertiser. So the agencies are representing a client, and that client has very specific guidelines, and we help implement those guidelines for all their media buys. Mm-hmm. So think of us as a planning tool, and we're on the buy side, helping the buy side engage the supply side. So the supply – sorry, the – yeah, I guess the supply side. So DSP is still the supply side in this in this scenario. We're helping the brand side, the clients, and the agencies interact with the networks and DSPs and buy programmatic media at scale with confidence. And when I say at scale, going back to the agencies, you know, agencies want to if they believe in the whitelist. They want to create their own, or they 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 they've figured it out. And and I've time and time again worked with agencies that say, yeah, we we spent four days uh, this week until 10:30, and we have this white list of 26,000 2,600 sites. Mm-hmm. And I'll look at that list and I'll say, great, and give it to me, and I scrub it and I look at it, and well, actually, based on your criteria, uh, these 500 are not where you want to be. And oh, by the way, we can get you to 9,000 sites if we were to uh, put this criteria into our database. Here are the sites you'd run on. Is this acceptable? Mm. Oh, yeah. Let's do that instead. And so all of a sudden, you know, what we're doing is we're an extension of the agency and advertiser. We're, we're, we're part of their team. And I think where we found a real, real nice part of it is in that planning stage because – Agencies and advertisers are against each other in this in, in, in these days because of fraud and viewability and a lot of these other transparency issues, where they're bidding for the business and not allocating enough staff to do the work that's become so necessary. Mm. The, and, ag- and, the agencies, the agencies are not doing enough work. Yeah, agencies don't have enough staff to do the work because they're bidding for the to win the business. And you know. and their their job has become super technical over time, right? And they're just like hey. they're outstripped in terms of training. And there's very few people went into you know advertising, and I'm one of them uh, that started in advertising that that had any intent of <laughs> and any idea that this was going to be so technical. Their marketers, a lot of them are very smart strategic thinkers, but then when you start getting into the weeds, it becomes a very technical business. And there are some great people on the agency side, no doubt, but then there's a long road ahead for some as well. And some agencies are, are clearly not up to speed. Some agencies are, are, are talking to brands that are not up to speed, and brands only have to answer to their CFO who just wants to know a number, and the number is lower. That's what they want to bid. That's what they want their CPMs. They want their spend lower. And so there's this clash amongst the agencies. I don't want to go back to the agency client 
behavior too much, but I, I think what's happening is, is agencies are are getting crushed by the brands because of the news that's out. Agencies are getting crushed because of CFOs are saying, why are we spending all this money? We don't want to. And agency and clients are sitting there like digital is the future. We have to. And so there's this huge problem and circle that's not going away. And, um, you know, I think uh, in terms of what Trustmetrics role is, is to clean up the ac- e- ecosystem and and help be that extension of the team by by providing value on stuff that they can't do themselves. So when when a brand goes to their agency and they say, the CFO of the brand says, hey, why are we spending so much money with you when there's all this risk of fraud and whatnot? And the agency comes back to them and, and, and says, oh, okay, well, actually, we're going to use trust metrics now and we're going to uh, increase our uh, quality that we display ads on and that's going to help things. Is, is that the way the conversation goes where where the agency kind of says, we need to add this other line item and then you're going to have better results, or you're going to have better brand safety? Like, Can you describe like a little bit more how how you've slotted yourself into it, you know, but honestly, part of this is, is, is I'm working on an advertising company right now. And I'm just curious about how you slot yourself in as a line item. I mean, maybe this is a, maybe this is a personal question for offline, but <laughs> how, how just strategically in this extremely complex marketplace, how you actually become a line item in the purchasing process. Yeah, no, I mean, that that's, I think, kind of the challenge for us is we are part of that planning layer and they think, you know, it, well, this is non-working media costs. I don't want to spend down it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the non-working media costs. And what I would t- I keep telling people is if you if you are just dismissing non-working media, your media won't be working. And I think that's become very clear with more and more of these ANA studies that fraud is not going away. There's a lot of problems in the ad ecosystems. And so if you continue to dismiss uh, these non-working media costs, you're, you're just just giving money not away. non non working media meeting stuff like trust metrics stuff like moat other basically ad infrastructure companies ad middleware yes, ad, sorry yeah so so the ad I'm t- I do a lot of ad tech speak and I apologize but the the non working media falls into ad serving falls into brand safety falls into verification viewability falls into ad creative and so you know most of these costs are continuing to rise because if you're doing media effectively, you're utilizing good rich media video. You're utilizing some cookies and targeting. I forgot to add that too. You're you're utilizing, you know, hey, let's track it and make sure this ad was viewed. There's a lot of things going in and you, there's a lot of different um, charts out there that will say X percent is going to non-working media and it just irks the CFOs. Mm. Why are we doing this? Mm. And I, I completely understand. But if they understood what's going on in our business, and I think the agencies need to do a much better job of communicating this, is if you don't spend in this non-working media, let's not even bother with digital because it's, it, it, there's just you're just throwing your money away. And that's where I think you know we, we are in the marketplace a lot with education and talking a lot about this. Our view is you need us and another security vendor. And the reason is we're going to make that other security vendor work even better because we're going to remove a lot of the sites that are causing them the headaches. When we look at a site, we're looking at this also with humans. And I can, you can see, and maybe you don't even know anything about digital, you can see that, that there's no way 400 million people are going to the site or 40 million people are going to the site. But if you look at the impressions, you can see someone said that this site had this many view, views or impressions. There, there are a lot of traps, and what we're saying is if you can if you can detect some of the bad guy sites with eyes and you remove them, they're going to cause less havoc to the other vendors. And that's where I think us plus another vendor helps. And, and when you ask the question around, you know, what, what's a good way to, you know, prevent us – plus another vendor. So a whitelist plus another vendor, I believe, is is a good long-term future. This doesn't give you 100% confidence, but I think at the end of the day, it's close enough. What is, so what, when you say that another vendor, uh, what, like, what would another vendor be? Like a, that would be a bot 
detection company detection perhaps? service like another security vendor right 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 yeah it makes sense i mean yeah so the, like you know there, there there's a couple that i'll just name uh ies double verify so ies is integral and science double verify uh white ops moat there's three or four of these guys that are that are in 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 the space that are good but you know unfortunately they're all reverse engineered at the same time so what we're saying is you know whitelist then use their service and you're you should be uh running a lot better quality list Mm. Can you talk a little bit more about how the whitelist is constructed? Like when somebody, when it, like if a if you want to work with a with if you want to work with a DSP, and the DSP comes to you and just like you know we've got these response like we've got these requirements. We've got you know we want to run we don't want to run on on sites with guns and uh, murder and lizards. <laughs> But we do want yep. to run on sites with ice cream and travel. And here's our current list of domains that we are running on. Give a bit more of a description, like for the engineers who are listening, like how, especially the thing I'm especially curious about is how you divvy up the work between the humans and the automated service. Sure. So uh, again, so let's just go back in the DSP example and uh, let's just move it to an ad network example because they're the ones that usually procure the inventory. So we're working on behalf of client, a client. The client has established their criteria and we sit with the client at the beginning to understand what they like and dislike. It's very much of a dating process. We have a very good client service team that kind of sits and does a lot of the talk with the client. We then get the ad network inventory they send us all the domains we look through their domains via the crawler look at the scores pull up the scores and start to understand what falls in our scoring system that would be acceptable for this brand we then share uh, some of the sites to get an, again another sense of where this brand's head is in terms of their thresholds to then continue to expand the list and make sure that these domains are acceptable to this advertiser one of the things I'll say is the machine is is does a lot of the heavy lifting in in terms of looking at all the variety of ways we look at for quality. So it's add to edit ratio, it's it's words on the page and words density. There's you know authorship, there's recency. You know, new, great one is news sites. They're categorized as news sites, but they haven't updated since 2013. There are a lot of factors in which we look at quality and what we look at uh, for quality and fraud and everything else that goes in from the machine. You know, for fake news, again, there are words that came into the marketplace like MSM is mainstream media or or crooked for crooked Hillary. There's word density that we've decided to go. So the New York Times still uses MSM or crooked because they're referencing someone something said. But then when we have a cluster of these words and we see it on this new site, well, then the human then takes another look. And I think it's really the machine and the human looking at the same time or or passing it to the human is really where we've seen the most success. Mm. And, and, and as, if you start looking at more and more fake news sites, and unfortunately we have to, we learn other themes, which we feed back into the machine. Hmm. Would you add to edit ratio? What is that exactly? Ads, like the, the amount of oh, ads oh, you have. Oh, okay. Uh, got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah. And so edit is, is words on the page. So add to edit ratio, meaning add to editorial ratio. Got it. So, so there, there's a privacy page of some fake news sites that I found that have, you know, very good paragraphs. However, it had 10 ads <laughs> on the, on the page. So I found a website that, uh, that I'm not going to name here, but when you went to the privacy page, it had 10 ads. And when you went after you went to another major advertiser, it was 10 of the same ads of, of a major advertiser. Oh, God. And, and, and we had caught this for a variety of reasons, but I kept going back there and, and looking because it just gives me good ideas of who maybe I should call next. And now they've taken the privacy page off their, their footer. You can't get there. Mm, but it's still there. But, but it's still there because I have the existing URL. So I keep going back to this one and seeing now there's only three ads on the page. It's unbelievable. I mean, you see things in my day job that you don't want to see. I've seen very aggressive porn, unfortunately. I've seen a lot of hate and hate is a very, very big thing and it's getting worse. And I would say that's one of the common themes lately of more and more requests coming from advertisers to stay away from hate. You know, fake news really made the news uh, at the election and has been ongoing. But 
some advertisers are not as concerned as others, but hate, everyone's concerned. And I think that's really been coming uh, more and more into the forefront. Mm. Well, you know, I, I think we're, we're drawing to a close, but it's it's been really good talking to you. I'd love to get a picture for how you think things are going to change in the next five years. I think the, you know, I think you hinted at that with maybe more Google, more Facebook, more Amazon, uh, but maybe there's some interesting other trends that you're thinking about, like, you know, I, I one I think about a lot is just the the increased ability for computers to generate content on the fly. Uh, you're you know starting to see some a- Amazon experiment with this with this computer generated uh, advertising, where basically they just take an item that they have in their store and they just like turn the stock footage or the stock pictures into exactly. into ads, which is pretty straightforward and bland but it's actually really effective uh in from my point of view i think it's like typical amazon just like ruthlessly cheap but really effective (laughs) and but it'll get really interesting when you see when you start to see computer generated on the fly creative that's like aesthetically appealing like you see uh, you know the example i always think about is like a computer generated version of like your mom serving you a coke or something like that (laughs) But what what do you think is going to change? I, I think that's probably more like ten years out. But what do you think is going to happen? In, well, maybe not though. What do you think is going to happen in the next five years? So, so actually, I think fraud is not going to go down, and it is not going down. It's the amount amount of reports that keep coming out with frauds going down. They're they're just flat out wrong. For the people who are focused on them, it is going down somewhat. Right. That's part one. So fraud is not going to ever go away. And I, unfortunately, I think it's going to get more sophisticated. And to your point, you're going to have more and more websites being spun up with a lot more sophistication. You're going to see – I mean you can go to Fiverr and buy content and have people write articles. You can go to Mechanical Turk and have people write content. You can have you know, a lot of the, these new, new services come out and, and, and continue to build now video content that looks actually very real. That's the scary part of it all is I think they're only going to get more sophisticated. But I think buyers will start to understand the risks and pitfalls associated to buying programmatically and will be more aware of some of the the, the, the roles and responsibilities some of the detection services like Trustmetrics and others play. And I think you know they will start holding people accountable. And when I say accountable, they won't pay people if they learn that their media is being – given to bad guys and and being wasted. And I think, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better is what I've been saying a lot lately. I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of the inventory is fake, so that means a lot of the companies that exist today are not doing the business they're saying they're doing. The risk is the public companies that are involved. If there are some public companies that are involved in in some of the supply, the risk is it's going to go down, and therefore the rest of the market is going to go down for for the ad ecosystem. I think the, 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 the tech stocks are going to get hurt, but they will all bounce back in a lot better way once we shuffle out, shuffle out and get rid of some of these bad guys. And once the buyers become more educated, I think that's when really we'll start to see those trend lines uh, spike up. And they'll, they'll spike up and bounce back because advertising, at least the hypothesis, I think, is that it's one of these things that's sort of like – like alcohol or gambling where you look over time and it's like regardless of the depression or the you know the, basically the economy uh, I think advertising pretty much stays the same like people just continue to spend the same amount inflation adjusted on advertising I could be wrong about that actually I may, am I just making that up maybe that's totally <laughs> made up I think what you're saying is it, that that there is an adjustment here and I think the adjustment actually is once you once you start finding humans with your advertisements, it will work. Yes. And and once you see that working, you will put more money in the channel. And once you start putting more money in the channel, you will grow your business too. There we go. And I and I think ultimately that's what's gonna happen. And advertisers have to get to the point in their mindset that it's okay to spend uh, a little higher CPM on on good quality impressions because ultimately if I'm reaching the humans, not just an impression loading, 
I will have the ability to sell more product. And if I can do that, I keep my day job. And and I think that's really what we're going to start seeing is the, the advocacy from agencies saying we need to spend CPMs higher and the fight with the advertiser getting to the realization of the CMO saying, yeah, you're right. I got to go tell my CFO this news and having the CFO accept that. Hmm. Okay, Mark. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's on fun. Yeah. Trust metrics makes a lot of sense to me. I I wish you the best of luck, and I look forward to talking to you more about these uh, interesting issues that a lot of people are a little afraid to talk about. I hear you. I hear you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash S-E daily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash S-E daily. Thanks to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow! 